As uh, Jim shared with you, you see it in your bulletin, we are starting a new sermon series. I love sermon series. I have to confess I'm one of those people who like to take a, to a big topic and break it down over the period of several weeks, several months. Uh, I, I, I love to get into studies. I've been sharing with you leading up to today, for the past few months, every time I've been preaching, I've been sharing who I am and the basics of what I believe, most importantly, how I view the character of God. And so today, we start a new series. The new idea is, what do we believe, how do I view what we believe, and how do we make it relevant for us today? You might not know this, but the Seventh-day Adventist Church has some unique teachings. We kind of stand out if we were to talk to other Christians around us. They would look at us very quickly. Uh, they'd start to look at some of our unique beliefs and say, are you guys even Christian? You hear this. I've heard this. And so one of the things that I want to do with you is I want to take some of our distinctive teachings and show you how they have to relate to a relationship with Jesus Christ. What I want to do, I, I want to start by asking a simple question, and I'll have it up on the screen here. It's actually a series of simple questions that start off, what if? I said I didn't love my wife anymore. The spark I once felt is gone. I used to read love letters from her. But now they just collect dust. We used to go out on dates together, but I couldn't wait until they were over and I could get back to my own life. She wants to change me. She wants to control me, my money, my food, my TV, my life. So I moved out. She still tries to call me, to reach me, but I hang up on her, delete her messages. She hopes that we can get back together soon. But I'm happy living my own life. Now, if things were that bad between Andrea and I, and they're not, Amen. <laughs> you would agree that we'd need real help to fix our relationship before it's too late, amen? My simple question is, are things that bad between you and God? Our message today is called Today. Today may be the most important day in your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we prepare to open your word, as we prepare to study what you've given to us, speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm kind of curious, by the way. How many of you are married? Show of hands. Married people. How many of you are certain today that your spouse loves you? That didn't take long. No, 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 think about it. Think about it. How many of you are certain, even after the breakfast how long it took to get out the door, how much gas was or wasn't in the gas tank, that pile of trash in the trash can. How many of you are still sure that your spouse loves you? All right. Now, this is a question for everybody here. How many of you have an assurance today that you were saved? Okay. One of the hardest things that we have to wrestle with is the concept of salvation. I could start anywhere I wanted in this series. If I want to talk about what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist, I could start anywhere that I felt like it. I could start like Mark Finley chooses to start and go into Daniel 2 because Daniel 2 is a great place to start. I could start just by breaking down our name. I'll spend the next month talking about Seventh-day Adventist. I could, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be sharing from the distinctive S's. Sabbath, Spirit of Prophecy, Second Coming, Stewardship, some of the distinctive teachings of the church. But the most important S's are the ones that I'm going to start by defining today. None of those other S's mean a thing if it wasn't for the three that I'm going to talk about today. And the first one is sin, the second one is salvation, and the third one is sanctification. If you don't understand these three things, if you don't understand the basics 
of what it means to be a Christian. It doesn't matter what day you go to church. It doesn't matter what you do with your money. It doesn't matter what you wear and what you read. It doesn't matter if you don't know Jesus Christ. And so today, I'm going to start by defining sin. We'll talk about salvation. We'll close with sanctification. When I'm done with these three, we're done. We go home. Sound good? We're on the same page? All right. So let's start with sin. What is sin? Okay. I hear some people saying transgression of the law. If you're familiar with the good old King James Version, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, sin is transgression of the law. You've heard that before. You've heard that? All right. I'm a mathematical person, and so I did it this way. Sin equals doing bad things. Is that right? Sin is transgression of the law. So in this way, sin is doing bad things. That's one way to look at that, right? It's pretty simple, but that's roughly what we're trying to pick up here. And that's the idea that we've, that we've clung to in a lot of our communications and interactions with other people, is that what we do is we sin and we try to expose sin by the things that we do. And so we look at other people and we say, well, what you're doing is sin. You're breaking the law of God. Sound right? Is that the only definition in the Bible for what sin is? Found another one for you. How about in James chapter 4 and verse 17? Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Mathematically speaking, that is now sin equals not doing good things. Did you catch the difference? Did you catch the difference between doing bad things and now we say here that sin is not doing good things? things. You with me here? It's a lot of doing, isn't it? It's a lot of what we do. I told you I'm a mathematical person. Let's test out anybody who's been in high school and above. What is the transitive property of math? I see some shrugging. Anybody know what the transitive property of math is? Okay, it goes both ways. That, that's that's, anybody, uh, does anybody back here know what the transitive property of math is? <clears throat> does anybody know what the transitive property of math is? Isn't that? All right, I asked a math teacher. She did a good job. I might have to uh, take her out on a date later. A equals B and B equals C, therefore A equals C. I got it on the screen. This is the transitive property of math. A equals B, B equals C, so A equals C. So let me ask you, if sin equals not doing good things and sin equals doing bad things, does that mean that doing bad things and not doing good things are the same thing? No. Why not? Is it possible to do something bad that has nothing to do with not doing anything good? Is it possible to not do something good that has nothing to do with doing something bad? All right, so now we're starting to recognize that this definition of sin that you find in the Bible, the Bible defines sin as bigger than just what we do, right? Sin is bigger than just what we do because if you look at these definitions, they don't seem to, cla they don't seem to work together. They seem to be pointing to something bigger, and these are specific applications. So think, for example, if you're driving down the street and you see somebody, it's raining, you're driving down the highway, and you see somebody who has their car that just had a flat tire. You know what's right. Suppose you have nowhere you need to be. You know what's right. It's raining, they've got a flat tire. What's the right thing to do? The right thing to do, of course, is to drive as slow as you can, roll your window down, and toss an umbrella to them because that's what they need and keep going, right? <laughs> Don't say that. I heard somebody say that's a good idea. <laughs> so part of this is doing something good. We're still talking about doing, though. Are there sins that have nothing to do with what we do? Yes. Are there sins on the inside? Get your Bibles. You got your Bibles? Open your Bibles. Open them to the book of Romans. 
One of the things I did that kept me so busy this summer is I decided, just for the fun of it, to take a class in the Book of Romans, a summer intensive, because I'm insane. I took a class with Dr. Che. It's a great class in the Book of Romans, but four weeks, three hours a day, it was a long, hard month of May. But he showed us something interesting in the book of Romans. The book of Romans is widely regarded as in the New Testament, this is the best place to understand the nature of sin, salvation, and sanctification. It seems that Paul is writing to a church. He wants to make sure that they've got it all together. And so he opens by talking about what is sin. And so the easiest way that he decides is to, buy, is, is to give examples of the results of sin. In Romans chapter 1, say amen if you're there. Can you just a second say hallelujah? All right, I'll wait for a few of you. Uh, but in Romans chapter 1, it's talking about God. And I've shared with you before that it's all about God in, in the book of Romans. God is responsible for everything. And so if I start reading, for example, in verse 26 in Romans chapter 1, for this reason God gave them over to their vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to their debased mind to do things which are not fitting. I'm going to pause for a second. Paul is about to give you a list of things that are not fitting for a relationship with God. This is actually a short list. One of Paul's contemporaries, a Jewish writer named Philo, had a list that was 140 items. I'm not going to do the 140 list. I'm going to do Paul's list. Listen to this kind of wickedness. Starting in verse 29, these are the people who are filled with all unrighteousness and sexual immorality and wickedness and covetousness, maliciousness. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They're whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Ooh, Paul! That's a list of people, isn't it? And if you, you read, or as you heard that list, does that sound familiar? When you look around at what's going on in society today, do you see some of that going on? You see what happens with, with the people who are, are, like it says, disobedient to their parents. They're untrustworthy. They're unloving. Oh, we're not done yet. Verse 32. Who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but approve of those who practice them. You've probably seen it in the news. You've probably seen it on Facebook. We're doing all sorts of things in today's society to approve of these practices, aren't we? You're starting to nod. You're starting to catch the picture here. This is sin, isn't it? Paul's not done yet. He doesn't lift his pen. There is no break when Paul wrote this letter to the church of Rome. We continue reading chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge... For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Paul starts off by talking about the things that are on the outside, the things that we do, the obvious sins. But as he moves deeper into the letter, he points out that even the sins in our heart are driving us away from God. Are there sins in our heart that drive us away from God? Are there things that we do in our hearts that though they might not be the practice on the outside, they're still sin? Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, gives us great examples. You don't have to murder somebody to be guilty of murder, do you? Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 21, he lists off several things. You don't have to be guilty of actually committing adultery to be guilty of committing adultery, do you? All you have to do is look. And Jesus actually talks about if your right eye causes you to sin, your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Some people take Jesus literally. History is full of men who decided to take Jesus literally, literally and chop off their hands and poke out their eyes. But let me ask you, can a blind man commit lust? You don't even have to see to commit lust. The issue with sin 
has to be a whole lot deeper than what we do. And so let me give you this definition that I'm working with here. I want to point out something to you, that sin is a broken relationship with God. Sins are the symptoms of that break. Do you catch the difference? Let's think of it in medical terms. If you went to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, you've, I, I know what your symptoms are, and so I'm going to treat you for your runny nose and your upset stomach, but they don't actually do anything to treat the disease, was that an effective doctor? Are there symptoms that are different than the disease? Okay. And so what, what do we do in our church today? What do we do with the difference between sin and sins? We have a great, it's one of, it happens in churches all across the country, all around the world. The idea that we want to focus on the sins, the symptoms. Did Jesus come to remove us from our sins? Did he come to remove us from our sins? Yes. But where did he start? With the sins or with sin? We all have a sin problem, don't we? We all have a broken relationship with God. Every single one of us, it might be something on the outside, it might be something on the inside, but we all have a bro broken relationship with God. Jesus didn't come to just stop us from doing those sins. He decided to kill the disease where it starts. And so he starts with sin. Where did Jesus work on sin? What did Jesus do to kill sin? What did Jesus do to kill sin? He died for us. Thank you. You kill the disease, you take care of the symptoms. The disease is a broken relationship. We call it sin. Let me ask you, let's make it practical, let's make it biblical. When Eve sinned, that first sin, did she sin for the first time in her hand? Or was it in her heart? It's in her heart. It was a broken relationship with God. The minute that she decided to listen to someone other than God, and then her broken relationship in the heart reflected her actions. Sound right? You're all with me. So if the problem is in the heart, it's not just what we do. If the problem of sin is in our heart, then how do we achieve salvation? What is salvation? Salvation, then, is a restored relationship. Salvation's a whole lot more than just doing good things. It's not, sin, salvation isn't not sinning. Make sense? Salvation isn't just not sinning. Salvation is being saved from sin. It is a restored relationship. Paul puts it this way in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, talking about the difference between our past lives and the lives that we could have today. He says, you were made alive, you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Anybody relate there? The wages of sin is death. Anybody here, sinner? We are all dead men walking, dead women walking, dead kids walking. You who were dead in trespasses and sins, he made alive in which you once walked according to the course of this world. You walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who works among the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Do you think God loves us? And God loves us. And God loves us. He raised, uh, or even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. He raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You notice that relationship of being in and with Christ Jesus? Jesus isn't just some distant guy. Jesus is supposed to be here. He's not there, he's here. That's the point. It is a restored relationship. Jesus is no longer distant. He's supposed to be here. For by grace you have been saved through faith, in verse 8. And that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God 
prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. What does it mean that we have been saved by grace through faith and not even that? It said specifically, we have been saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves, it's a gift from God. Let's put it this way. Let's say that to celebrate your 25th anniversary here, you decide to cook. And I know that you're a good cook, but you get kind of busy. And so you decide that you're going to go down just down 94 and you decide to go to Carabas. And you pick up this nice dinner and, and you decide to do something special, light the candles, and, and, and you take the food out of the, out of the to-go box and you put it on the plate and, and you serve it. And, and you say, look at this wonderful meal that I've prepared for you. Look at this wonderful meal that I'm putting before you. Is that being completely honest? Not completely honest. Because who prepared the meal? Some guy in the kitchen. All you did was reach out and accept the bag. Somebody else did the hard work. Faith is a gift from God. Faith is something that's given to us. The opportunity to be saved, the opportunity to have a restored relationship does not begin with us. It begins with Him. The incentive to have that restored relationship does not start with us, it starts with Him. All we do is unfortunately get in the way. Way too often we get in the way. How many can relate? You get in the way sometimes. God wants to give it, and we don't want it. Today is the day that you can say that you want it. There's another passage. Luke chapter 23. This is our scripture reading today. Do you have to be perfect to be saved? Do you have to be perfect to accept Jesus Christ as Savior? Do you even have to be a good person to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? No. What does this passage say? The story that Riley read for us. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. Did you hear that? If you are the Christ. Is Jesus the Christ? Is the same if statement Jesus hanging on the cross to prove that he's the Christ is that same if statement that Jesus heard in the wilderness. Right after Jesus was baptized, you, you hear the voice of God booming out and saying, this is my son. The very next word that you hear in Matthew chapter 4 is, if you're the son of God. The devil likes to do what he can to put in those little if statements. Can you really believe God's word? We'll talk about God's word in another, another message. If you're, the, if you're the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, saying, Don't you fear God, seeing we're under the same condemnation? We indeed justly, we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Did he try to put on a show? Did he try to straighten his tie, fix his hair, make a promise to pay his offerings and come to church every week? He knew that he had nothing to offer God except for a heart. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. You've got it, right? I, I read it like that intentionally. You see it in the English, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's how it's written in the English. But that's not how it was originally written in the Greek. The Greek originally had no punctuation, had no lowercase letters, had no spaces between the words. And so it would have run together like, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's what it, that's what it would have said. We added some of these things later so that we could understand it. Is it possible that by adding punctuation, we may have changed the intended meaning of what was originally said? What is said here is, assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let me give you an example of the importance of punctuation. Got it on the screen. An English professor wrote the words, a woman without her man is nothing. On the chalkboard, ask their students to punctuate it correctly. All of the males in the class wrote, a woman without her man is nothing. All of the females in the class wrote, a woman without her 
man is nothing. <laughs> Same words, punctuation made the difference, doesn't it? And so some people take this passage, they read it through with the commas inserted as they were inserted by the translators long ago. Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise to believe that when you die, you go to heaven. Because Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Pause for a second, though. When you die, or let's ask Jesus. Let's, let's start with Jesus. When Jesus died, did he go straight to heaven? Can you prove it? How? He tells this. John chapter 20 and verse 17. Mary Magdalene comes up to Jesus and she's excited. Rabbi! And he says, don't touch me because I haven't gone to my father yet. If this is Sunday and he hasn't gone to the father, what makes you think that today he went with the thief on the cross to paradise back on Friday? Didn't happen, did it? They've got the comma wrong. The emphasis there is on the word today. As in, assuredly, I say to you today, today is the day that I've given you a ticket to paradise. Today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day that you can have a relationship with me. Today. And so what's the temptation? When you hear today can be the most important day of your life because you give your life to Jesus Christ. The temptation is the most dangerous word in the English language, according to John Ortberg. What is the most dangerous word in the English language? Tomorrow. As in, I'll get around to it tomorrow. I'll start praying tomorrow. I'll work on my relationship with Jesus tomorrow. I'll change my life tomorrow. It's been said that every time your heart is impressed and you put it off, you're less likely to be impressed in the future. Don't wait till tomorrow. Why is it that people decide when they want to change their lives, oh, I'll get around to that for New Year's? Why do we wait for a New Year's resolution? If you decide that you're you're 20 pounds overweight, you want to lose the weight, why not start today? If you decide that you want to eat better, if you want to stop smoking, you want to stop drinking, you want to stop doing all those things, why do you have to wait till tomorrow? Why not start today? If you want to stop hardening your heart to God, you want to renew that relationship with Him, why wait till tomorrow? Why not today? And so let's review. Let's review. Sin. Sin is a broken relationship. Amen? Salvation, then, is this free gift of a restored relationship. Sanctification, big fancy word, simply means a growing relationship. If I knew nothing more about my wife, if I treated her no differently now than I did when I first met her 11 years ago, what would our relationship be like? Stagnant. How many of us have a growing relationship with Jesus Christ? It's been said also by John Ortberg, I don't have the uh, citation for it though, that one of the most scandalous things that he sees in churches is when you have people who go to church for 15 or 20 years and have never had their lives changed one bit. And he says he doesn't know what's more scandalous, the fact that that person hasn't been changed or the fact that nobody else around him seems to care. Sanctification, a growing relationship. Church family, I care. I want to do whatever I can to encourage you to have a growing relationship. If you need to learn how to understand what you read in your Bible, I can help you do that. If you want to actually work with your prayer life, I can teach you techniques. I can teach you habits and behaviors. I can't change your heart, though. The pastor can do all sorts of things for you, but the decision has to be one between you and God, not between you and me. All I can do is encourage you along that path. My favorite passage, I've read it for you before, sanctification. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. What is sanctification? Starting in verse, chapter 3 and verse 12. Was Paul a good guy, by the way? Was he, did he do some good things? 
I mean, he wrote like 14 books in the New Testament and, and converted just, I mean, he planted churches all over uh, Asia and Europe that are our, our ancestors for today. Paul says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected. Paul says, I'm not perfect, but I press on, that I might lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of for me. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but the one thing I do I forget the things which are behind. I reach forward towards those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal of, or for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Today can be that first day for you. For many of you, this may be just another day, another step forward in your relationship. But for some of you, this might be your first day. And so I know I did a lot of talking. I want to show you just a little video, a little three-minute video. And just out of curiosity, I uh, gave you these little red cards at the beginning of service. You've still got the red cards? Pull them out. Let me see them. You got them? All right. I want to show you a video real quick. Uh. Next. Aisle, please. Mm -hmm. Some lying, some stealing, and some acts of kindness here and there. I tried to live a good life. Well, let's see how good. This way. Next. Bio, please. Okay, I admit it. I did a lot of bad things. Yes, I see. But I've done good things too, you know, to offset the bad things. Like one time I cheated on a test, but then I cleaned up trash in the park. Mm-hmm. That should balance out, right? Let's find out. This way. That should have balanced out, right? It should have balanced out. Next. Bio, please. Impressive. Oh, yeah. I devoted my entire life to making this world a better place. I dug wells in Africa. I donated blood every month. And I ran an orphanage in India. I mean, I just wish I could have done more. Mm-hmm. And is this your subscription? I only read the articles. I only read the articles! Next. My mom goes to church. I was baptized as a baby? Take American Express, right? Next. File, please. Whoa. Somebody's been busy. Well, let's get this over with. Sorry, um, I didn't know he was with you. Okay, step on the scale. Not you. Him. Hey, wait a minute. That is totally not fair. <laughs> That's why it's called grace. Next. So, you've got this little red card. You know what's on it. You know in your life, if they were to look at the file folder of your life, you know what's written on this card, right? You don't have to say it. God knows it, though. Your folder may have dozens of them, hundreds of them. But let's make it simple. This red card is not the sins. It's the broken relationship. How many of you want to take the broken relationship home? If you do, stick it in your Bible. Carry it with you. 
If you don't want to carry the broken relationship home, though, if you want a better option, if you want a renewed and restored relationship with Jesus Christ today, I'll give you a chance to turn it in, trade you out for something better. I've got these cards here that I want to give you. Reminders, I am a child of God, Romans 8, 15. Our song team's already come forward. I'm going to ask Janelle Randall. She's our first elder. She's going to stand on one side for the sake of, of speed. I'm going to have Janelle stand on one side. You'll just come forward. If you want to give up your red card, you'll hand it to her. She'll give you a white card. I'm going to ask Pastor Karen Graves to come forward. She'll be on this other side over here. Karen will do the same thing. You can turn in, your, you can turn in the symbol of your broken relationship. You don't have to carry it home with you. Turn it in. Take this reminder of the fact that you are a child of God. Romans 8.15 reminds us that we've been bought, we've been adopted, we can cry out, Father. And so in your quiet places and wherever you are in life, you have the opportunity to make two decisions. You can either reach for your sins or you can reach for your Savior.